I got to start the story, the war story, because by long-standing tradition, every fighter pilot war story has to start with the same three words. There I was. So <laughs> there I was. TJ, that's for you. General Johnson in the back was there too in a different airplane. Uh, but we were uh, we were for the first time using uh, the large numbers of precision weapons. So in a, instead of shooting a missile by a thousand meters. Uh, we were, in fact, dropping bombs within a couple meters uh, of the target. Uh, the mission I'm talking about today, we were, uh, I had like 30 aircraft, a uh, fairly large armada, and uh, we were going to attack Iraq in their fields. There I am, uh, quite a bit younger, substantially better looking, and uh, that airplane, the F-111, was one of the fighters that I flew in my low career, and at this time, they were uh, a significant part, a major part, of the precision-guided ordnance capability of the Air Force. The real star of the story is, is this weapon. Uh, that happens to be a 2,000 pound laser guided bomb. Obviously there are other ways to get precision, including uh, you know, GPS uh, guided weapons. But this really was the first large scale uh, way that we could strike uh, a target very precisely within a few feet instead of distance. Dumb bombs before this type of precision, even a highly qualified crew flying a modern uh, fighter uh, would drop a ballistic weapon and once it was off the airplane it would go where it's going to go. So you, wherever you pointed it, it was going to land. And typical miss distances were tens of feet to hundreds of feet. That's significant. And the difference between miss, missing by tens to hundreds of feet and hitting within a couple of feet uh, changed all sorts of things about air warfare. I'm going to talk about just one particular type of target that was affected in the way it affected air warfare uh, by talking about a thing called the hardened aircraft shell. So I got a backup. Just a couple of years, four to five years earlier, I was assigned in Europe. These are not airplanes, these are air bases. The black ones are uh, NATO air bases, NATO, US. The red ones are Soviet and Warsaw Pact. And if we had a fight in Europe, which is what we trained for every day, uh, both sides knew that they had to win the fight uh, for the airspace over the battlefield very quickly if they were going to have any chance of success. So we were going to come fight them in the air, and we were going to basically try and destroy as much of their air force as we could on the ground. And my role, what I trained for every day, was, was that second mission. So we would go to try and attack their airfields, they would try and attack ours. The uh, advent of the hardened aircraft shelter was a very important innovation by both sides. Both sides had it. This uh, piece of, uh, uh, of architecture was two to three feet of uh, steel reinforced concrete. It had heavy steel and concrete blast doors on railroad tracks. They were so heavy that you had to roll them on tracks. And inside, it was a nice, clean, safe place to uh, fit your airplane. So we would go out to our shelter, we'd go in and it'd be all buttoned up. Uh, the uh, maintenance crews would be loading weapons and fuel uh, in those airplanes, prep them for flight. We would get in, start the engines, we'd roll those blast doors open, and we would roll out at high speed, get on the runway, and go. Uh, it was a very effective way uh, to protect your force on the ground. If a bomb actually did hit those uh, shelters, they, they were very likely to skip off. That was why they were often curved or angled in different ways. So it was a tough mission. My mission as an offensive guy trying to tap this kind of uh, shelter uh, was pretty typical like this, what we trained for. We'd take off with a dozen or so airplanes. Uh, we would come out of our shelters, we'd get airborne, and we'd go racing across the you know northern Europe uh, at low altitude. I'm talking like treetop level, 50, 100 feet. Uh, to stay below the uh, sand belts and the enemy uh, air defense systems. Uh, we would approach our target airfield at high speed, low level, uh, typically 540 knots, those kind of airspeed. We would snap the nose up, and we would all split in different directions, pull the nose up about 45 degrees, flip over on our back, try and acquire our target visually, pull the nose down, line the airplane up, uh, and then try and drop those dumb bombs accurately enough to penetrate a shelter. So what I would see while I was on my back was that. Uh, that's how the shelters were arranged, different angles, different directions, each with their own little taxiway, get them on the runway. And so here I am, I'm trying to pick out my shelter and get a line in order to try and get a penetrating weapon into that shelter. A pretty low payoff kind of a, a attack profile. And oh, by the way, everybody on that airfield was trying to defend it was shooting at you while you were hanging in the air there upside down, trying to deliver a weapon. Okay, fast forward, five years. Saddam Hussein had invested heavily in NATO and Warsaw Pact uh, technologies. He had an integrated air defense system. You can see he had uh, hundreds of uh, modern fighters, Soviet and French, typically. Uh, and he had invested heavily in hardened aircraft shelters to defend against the kind of attacks he expected from us. But something had changed. 
that something was added to a bit large uh, numbers of precision weapons. So what I'm going to show you next is a short video clip, a little less than a minute. You're going to uh, hear the air crew um, with the uh, obscenities deleted, uh, uh, and they're going to be talking about their bomb run. You're going to, there are other airplanes dropping weapons, and you're going to see shelters be under attack. It's going to look just about like that target I showed you before, that airfield, except now these penetrating weapons are hitting at the right angle, at the right point, in order to go into those concrete shelters and destroy what's inside. Uh, you'll hear some tones in the background. That's kind of threat warning systems. Crank up the volume, please. Okay, so uh, the world had changed, uh, and this was a surprise not only for the Iraqis, but really for air power theorists uh, all over the world. Uh, there was uh, many things that changed since then, I'll mention in just a second. I want to show you, that was kind of a pristine view from 20,000 feet of, of what those attacks looked like. I want to show you what it looks like if you're on the receiving end of that kind of attack. You probably need the volume down uh, to edit and run it. The Allies began to concentrate their attacks on these shelters by day seven of the air campaign. Laser-guided bombs penetrated and destroyed over 300 of them. Since they couldn't survive in the air or on the ground, Iraqi aircraft began to run toward Iran in mass by day nine. I think that the one thing that this war has done from an air power standpoint, without a doubt, and it has changed mass to precision. So precision was the technological surprise of that war. Again, a surprise to many people. And of course, the world doesn't stop, right? So since we had, had that major leap ahead, which gave us a significant advantage, uh, our adversaries and our friends have both copied uh, the advantages of precision and come up with new ways to keep us at arm lengths or uh, prevent us from using that precision with the same effect. So the good news here, and I'm sure everybody's making the rounds on the demo floor, is you're gonna see a range of technologies uh, that are trying to give us a similar set of advantages for the future. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Uh, question? Thank you for that presentation. Now, before the smart bombs, you would fly 1,500 feet and then you go back and then you're the one who marks it. When you're 20,000 up, who marks those barracks? for you to send the precision guide in. So, so these particular, I, I didn't point out all of the uh, uh, details on the video, but the air crew that dropped that weapon uh, were also holding a laser spot on the target. And then the bomb steers to that laser spot, the big fence on that weapon that you saw in the video or in the slide where I was standing next to it. Uh, there are other ways to do it with GPS, but uh, that was a, a closed loop kind of system between the aircraft and the weapon. Yeah, well, it's a pod, uh, the guy has a controls, a little control stick, and he's manually holding the spot on the target. There are some auto-lock systems, too, but that was how it was done, you know, uh, those weapons. So, oh, by the way, laser weapons are still used. They're used uh, from Predators uh, and other, you know, manned platforms even today. Other questions? So, precision guidance and the laser guidance technologies back in that war. In terms of future technologies, buddy, what do you see changing the air picture? So, so I don't see, uh, and oh, by the way, the, the laser and precision of that was also enabled by other things like stealth, which allowed us to penetrate those uh, 
uh, air defense networks and have that kind of uh, attack profile as opposed to being low level. Uh, and I, I see a similar thing now. There's no single technology, but there are groups of technologies. Uh, you know, I know we're investing heavily in system assistance kind of technologies to allow groups of manned and unmanned systems to operate together. So what are the underlying components that allow you to do that? Uh, robust networks, and I don't just mean cyber, but basically battle command and, and platform, uh, platforms network together. Uh, I think that RF spectrum dominance, which will allow us to both defense and offense, uh, use the electronic spectrum to our advantage. And, uh, and ISR, I mean, uh, a lot of what's gone on, that, I mean, that requires good information about the targets that you're attacking. And so, robust space and penetrating ISR platforms. Uh, so, more of a combination. Go ahead. Given the vulnerability of these shelters to precision bombs, is that now led to an alternative way to try to protect these planes when they're on the ground? Yeah, one of the one of the responses of adversaries in, 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 uh, uh, to protecting against that type of attack is going uh, hardened and deeply buried for the things that they really value. For example, North Korea has much of their real uh, hardware inside the mountains. Uh, now there are other ways to kind of counter that. that pretty, provides vulnerabilities too, but without going into the specifics, yes, people realize that two and a half meter uh, steel reinforced concrete is not protection from a precise weapon. Last night somebody raised, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, what, what percentage of the uh, bombs uh, failed or dis misfired? So, so it kind of depends on, on the type of failure. I mean, there, there were some where basically if there was a battery failure or something like that, it would go, it would go ballistic, right? And not die. So, uh, but uh, there's also, I mean, there's also uh, a, a misrange even with the precision weapon. And I would say that we had, uh, I mean, the, the, the hitting within uh, 10 meters of the aim point, roughly 80%, 80-85% of our weapons uh, there was a gold power survey that was done after that war that put out all the stats, but they were not 100% reliable, but they were pretty darn good. Uh, were the lasers visible wavelength, and are there any con-ops where that would be relevant? Were those visible wavelengths? No, they were, they were not. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, they were uh, coded lasers so that my spot and your spot didn't so that our weapon was coded to a particular uh, laser code, which is a weapon. But uh, they were not, uh, they were neither eye safe uh, nor visible. Right. <laughs> Last night, somebody brought up, uh, buddy, how, how do you see a role for unmanned systems in combat uh, yeah. in the Air Force? Yeah, I, I think that the, the and, and I think the way the question was phrased, do you see fighter on fighter kind of uh, combat in the very near future with unmanned systems, and I, my basic belief is no. I believe, though, that uh, manned systems operating with unmanned systems to do other parts of the uh, defensive and offensive part of that combat, weapons delivery, jamming, uh, is, is very, not only likely, but necessary. So I, I think that the degree of autonomy needed to make a fully uh, autonomous airplane fight a manned airplane is a couple decades ago. That's opinion. Okay.